Uh, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. So this webinar is uh, on SUDEP data and standardization through use of common data elements. Uh, my name is Cecilia Nume, I'm a PhD student from Norway and I will be chairing this webinar. Um, so um, before we start, uh, I would like to tell you two important things. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the Q&A section. Um, and um, um, also, uh, when we're done, uh, with the, there will be four talks here. So when we're done, we will have this have a Q&A session, and we will also have uh, a session where you can give feedback. Uh, so, so please stay on for that after the webinar. Um, uh, so first, I would like to thank the organizers for this webinar, so Cure Epilepsy, uh, which is, has been organizing this and also together with uh, the International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, and we also have webinar partners here, that's the Band Foundation who has been supporting this, uh, and also the ELA Young Epilepsy section. Uh, so the Young Epilepsy section in the ELA is, is for uh, young researchers and, and also people below 40 years of age that are interested in epilepsy. So. It's possible to also join that if you're not already a member. Um, regarding cure epilepsy, so this is uh, um, a very important um, organization that's been working towards improving uh, treatment for epilepsy and, and also other aspects of epilepsy. So it, it's actually leading non-governmental funder epilepsy research in the world. It has raised over $90 million for research and funded over 300 research projects uh, within 17 different countries. Um, and it's also founded many different aspects of this, so like pediatric epilepsy research, uh, post-traumatic epilepsy, uh, treatment-resistant epilepsies, uh, also sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which is what we will talk about today, uh, and also sleep and epilepsy and advancing so the goal is to search for a cure and eliminating uh, treatment side effects and also raising, uh, reversing deficits caused by frequent seizures. Um, so uh, for today, uh, today we webinar today, we will talk about common data elements. And I guess many of you have already know a lot about this, but, and we will learn a lot more about this during these talks we're gonna have. Uh, so basically these are data elements, um, that can be standardized in, in research um, and will also to uh, may, maybe make it easier to do research, but also to, to standardize it to get uh, more standardized results. Um, and you can also use it for several other purposes that we will learn more about today. And so uh, for today's webinar, we will have four different speakers um, and they're all very, very experienced um, with epilepsy and they have worked with different aspects of epilepsy. Uh, so first you will hear here uh, Wiki Wittermore. Uh, she is the program director of the Division of Neuroscience uh, within the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes. So she will start and, and after that it will be Aristea Galanopoulou. Uh, she's a professor at um, uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, and then we will have Christos Lisgaras. Uh, he's a neuroscientist and a researcher at the Nathan S. Klein Institute for Psychiatric Research. Uh, and in the end, we will have Laura Lobers who will talk um, even more about some data elements and how you can use them. And she's the chief uh, scientific office officer within the Cure Epilepsy. Uh, so with this, uh, I think we can start the webinar and I will give um, the word to the first speaker, which is Vicky Wittermore. Thank you, Cecile, and welcome everyone. It's very nice to be here today, and thank you so much to the organizers, ILAE and CURE, for organizing this webinar. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and the next slide. 
So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the history of the development of common data elements at NINDS. So NINDS is the institute at the National Institutes of Health that supports research on neurological diseases, including epilepsy, and that also includes SUDEP. Um, so the Common Data Element Program was initiated in 2006 with the goal of developing standards for performing NINDS-funded neuroscience-related clinical research, and specifically for clinical trials. So the intent was to standardize data collection, decrease study startup time, provide more complete, comprehensive, and equivalent data across studies, simplify data sharing and data aggregation, facilitate the deployment of evidence-based guidelines and recommendations. So the common data elements in, in all cases were developed by the community, working together with NINDS program staff and a contractor that helped with the coordination. And there's an um, continues to be for all of the neurological diseases that we've developed common data elements for. There's an oversight committee that continues to review and revise the common data elements on an annual basis across all the common data elements for all neurological diseases, as well as on a disease specific um, basis. And the next slide, please. So overall at NIH, there also is a common um, data element by a repository at the National Library of Medicine. So when, for example, the common data elements are completed for epilepsy clinical studies, they're then uploaded and approved by the National Library of Medicine and available then for all investigators to utilize in their research. So the common data elements we now have in place really support and help to support our new NIH data management and sharing policy that requires in investigators to publicly share the data that is a result of NIH-funded research. So, as I said, it helps the researchers to share and combine data sets meeting these funding requirements and save time. And again, there's both disease-specific as well as overarching domain common data elements. So, for example, the demographics don't need to be redone um, for every single disease. There are common demographic um, common data elements for things like age, sex, that sort of thing. Um, there's a renewed effort now to really expand the development and use of clinical common data elements and to add preclinical common data elements to the National Library of Medicine repository. Um, and the, I think it's really important, um, not only from a data sharing perspective that everyone understands what they these common data elements are, but also utilize them in your research. And um, they're now very often discussed in the review of NIH grant applications. And as we can discuss later, um, this really became an issue in SUDEP preclinical studies, when reviewers started saying, well, are there common data elements? So I understand as a reviewer, what is the cause and manner of death of, of these animals? Is it really an epilepsy-related death? So those are the kinds of things that now come up in review and reviewers are looking for as they review grant applications. And so the um, URL here for the National Library of Medicine repository is available for you to, to go to. And the next slide. So the, in particular, the epilepsy clinical CDEs were developed. And this is, I think, the first paper reporting out in 2011, the development of the epilepsy common data elements. And you can see the original um, nine domains or categories that were developed, where common data elements were developed. Um, we had originally identified anti or called them anti-epileptic drugs um, that because that's what they were called back then. Um, we're working to get that changed in the common data elements to anti-seizure medication. And there's now 637 epilepsy common data elements in this in the NLM 
CDE repository that really reflects expansion and um, additional common data elements to really cover all aspects of research in clinical epilepsy. And the next slide. Um, the, shifting then to the preclinical CDEs, and you'll he'll hear much more about this from Aristea and from others, but this effort um, it was initiated with a workshop in the in the UK in 2012, and the ILAE and AES formed a joint task force in 2013 to work together on the development of preclinical CDEs and partnered with NINDS. So the preclinical CDE task force was co-chaired by Jackie and Aristea and Helen Scharfman and managed by Lauren Hart Hardgrove, who at that time was a postdoc with, with Helen Scharfman and was supported by ILAE. So the representation was by a diverse um, group of investigators across several countries, and that was really critical to the effort, I think, to come together to develop those common data elements to improve rigor and transparency of preclinical epilepsy research, to utilize the CDEs when performing especially multi-site preclinical studies to standardize data collection and sharing. Um, and what we find in reports and publications is that the preclinical epilepsy studies don't always describe methods and, and results in a consistent manner, making meta-analysis really quite challenging. The, there was an attempt to mirror the clinical epilepsy CDs as much as possible as you can for animal models compared to studies in humans. And as I said, this was developed by a joint task force of the ILE and American Epilepsy Society led by Aristea. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Aristea and look forward to hearing all of the other speakers and to answering questions and hearing your feedback at the end of the webinar. So thank you. Thank you so much for a great talk and, and a great introductions to the common data elements. Uh, we give it more that was really good. So then we will continue with the, uh, um, yeah, there's another thank you slide. <laughs> so thank you. And then we will continue with uh, with Aristea Galanopoulou. I'm sorry if I'm right, say you know name wrong, but please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Cecilia, and uh, thank you, Vicky, for an excellent introduction to the whole concept and uh, work on uh, common data elements. What I will present today is the effort that the Joint Translational Task Force of the ILE and AES undertook several years ago uh, with the main focus to generate common data elements for preclinical epilepsy research. The next slide, please. And if you could also advance. Thank you. So the main purpose for the creation of the Joint Translational Task Force is, was to optimize and accelerate preclinical epilepsy research with the purpose of developing medications and treatments that can be translatable to humans. And several years back, um, around 2011, 2012, it culminated there were a lot of concerns about the accuracy and the efficacy of translation. And there's a lot of publications, including from NNTS, um, a key report that we published in 2012 uh, jointly between AES and ILE that raised concerns about some of the practices of the clinical research. And the study that I highlight here in on the left uh, exactly indicates the uh, amount of not only time, but also funds that we lose if we don't change practices, specifically the cost of bringing a new drug to the clinic successfully for CNS diseases is, is around $766 million. And this is largely due to the failed trials. So the whole purpose of generating standards and uh, common data elements for preclinical research was to improve this process and de-risk the process of developing new medicines. The next slide. So as a result, uh, there was a joint effort, as I mentioned, starting in 2011. It culminated in 2013 with uh, the creation of the Joint Translational Task Force. And when we convened, uh, we basically uh, set some priorities for the work groups uh, to, uh, to do. Um, and the task one 
work group was largely tasked for the harmonization of rodent electrophysiological studies. Uh, and the idea is to make it more, uh, to improve the way that we conduct and interpret the studies in a manner that could translate and compare with the clinical standards that we have, task two systematic reviews. And the task three is the specific set of work groups that we created to generate the preclinical epilepsy common data elements. And task four had to do with the uh, infrastructure of the multicenter preclinical studies that at the time were lacking. And I like to show this slide because this was really a community effort and it, it combined experts, not just from the preclinical arena, but also clinicians, uh, funders, uh, investigators across different geographical locations and across different career stages. And this is the type of communication and conversation that needs to take place to change the landscape of uh, translational research. We had a lot of support at the time, including from Cure Epilepsy and NTS and other uh, organizations that I um, list here, meaning that there is a lot of interest in changing and improving the uh, translational research. Next slide, please. So the common data elements are standardized, precisely defined questions that are paired with a set of allowable responses that are used systematically across different sites, different studies, clinical trials, or preclinical trials nowadays to ensure consistent data collection and reporting. And the main purpose is to generate a common language among investigators to agree upon comparable standardized methodologies and assessments, hoping to improve the way that uh, research is done, promote the transparency in reporting, and facilitate the study comparisons across labs, as well as enable data sharing and big data research by allowing deposits of data in uh, big databases. A term that it is important to keep in mind is the FAIR principles that uh, advocate for creating findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data through our research. And with a graph here, I basically try to uh, schematically simplify the whole purpose of the business of creating common data elements. If you have two studies that uh, are using completely different practices or ways of reporting or ways of logging the data. At the end of the day, the research output, they have different types and you can have, you're gonna have hard time comparing. But if you have two studies that utilize the same common data elements, although they may have different starting points or resources, at the end of the day, they create output that has similar types and can be compared and can uh, allow uh, assessment as to the validity uh, or um, uh, differences between the, the results of the studies. Next slide. So in the translational task force, the way that we uh, went by to create this kind of uh, preclinical CDs, realizing that this is an important uh, impact that we're trying to generate for the uh, practice of the day of the researchers. We generated multiple working groups uh, with experts from different backgrounds and different uh, origins. Uh, these were topic oriented work groups and we considered the existing reports uh, on the preferred methodologies that the translational task force had already created, meaning the task one report reports of, on the uh, EEG and electrophysiological studies and other reports that we had that uh, advocated for certain uh, standards uh, of practice for the translational epilepsy research. We had as a basis and as a template the NINDS clinical CDs that Vicky uh, described. Uh, and the uh, goal was to generate case report forms, CD charts, and companion papers. Uh, I will explain in the subsequent slides what each of those terms are. Companion papers uh, are largely manuals that explain the use of the CRFs and the CDs uh, for the investigator. Next slide. This is an example of a case report form. This is something that all of us use in the daily research 
These are forms that we can use either on a paper format or in a digital format uh, in, uh, in our computers to log experimental conditions and data. And these are easily recognizable by the um, human eye. Next slide. The CD charts uh, we call spreadsheets, for example, from uh, Excel or another database that list the data elements, the exact types of data that we collect or utilize, and each data element has specific features. And this is the list of the features that we had to discuss and put in the CD chart so that the analysts can understand what we're talking about and can uh, generate uh, a dig digital form of a database uh, for the investigators to use. And examples of that is the ID of the CD, uh, name, variable, definition, the question text that we ask to the investigator to, uh, to respond to, permissible values, as I mentioned, we have to offer specific uh, values for the investigators to, to utilize so that the analysis can be streamlined, um, and many other uh, features. Um, as I'm gonna also mention later, the priority level is something that we came to use at the Translational Task Force for the purpose that uh, we wanted to give a sense of urgency or priority for the investigators, because at the end of the day, not all of the data elements could be useful for a specific study that one investigator uses. But we wanted to highlight which ones are important to generate a high quality research and a research that could be comparable with uh, many other similar types of research. So the priority level is the recommendation of the experts of the task force as to how important a specific data element is for a specific study. The next slide. So there's different uh, modules, as we call them. Each module has a specific purpose. For example, for the animal selection and preparation, we generated what we call core CRFs. Uh, that describe the models, the study design, treatments, pharmacology, uh, treatment administration, and so on. Uh, and obviously, specifically for uh, uh, studies that utilize EEG, they have different components, including the surgery, video EEG acquisition, video EEG monitoring, video EEG scoring. And for each of those steps, we generated CRFs for the investigators to use. Obviously, a study that does not include EEGs, they do not need to use the CRFs, but we offered uh, several other options for investigators to use. The next slide. So, as I mentioned, the, uh, we felt that the common data elements uh, could have impact on the work of investigators throughout the world. So that was a huge responsibility. And we felt that we had to get a community feedback for the work that our work groups were doing. Uh, so the way that we uh, went to achieve that was to organize presentations, discussions with the community at open forums, at congresses. Uh, we circulated the drafts uh, routinely through the whole task three members. That was uh, too many to mention. And they were included in the initial slide that I presented. Uh, they went through a process of revision, creation of CD charts overseen by a project manager. Lauren was fantastic in uh, trying to do this kind of chore uh, that required a lot of uh, meticulousness. And uh, we submitted the final products to the leadership of the ILE AES for approval to submit them. And then uh, in uh, the journal that we submitted, uh, again, for the same reason that we wanted to give, uh, to augment the feedback of the community uh, on the final product, each report underwent peer review by four to eight experts per manuscript. That was obviously a huge toll for the authors because they had to uh, respond to multiple uh, comments, uh, critiques, and questions but we felt that that was necessary to improve the, the validity of the product. After the manuscripts were published, we also went another step and we publicly posted at the ILE website for public commentation, something that ILE does routinely for position papers, and we received additional feedback from that. 
Uh, and a very last step that we uh, uh, did is to try to generate digital CRFs and make them available to the investigators, feeling that if we left the investigators on their own to have a huge load of paper CRFs, and then uh, it, was, it would be up to them to generate databases to input, that would take a lot of time and would decrease the enthusiasm to do them. So for the, if I have the next slide, please. So we took several of the um, published uh, common data elements that uh, the work groups generated uh, and the specific topics of those uh, were published in uh, two special issues. The one that was published back in 2018 in Epilepsy Open uh, covered the core CDs, CDs for neurobehavioral uh, studies pharmacology CTEs, how can you test a drug to an animal model of seizures or epilepsy, physiological CTEs, uh, how do you assess the condition of the animal or physiological parameters for the experiments that you do, as well as the rodent EEGs. I mentioned some of the examples of the CRFs in earlier slides. The next slide. And the most recent set that is currently uh, in, uh, online in Epilepsy Open, and the special issue is very much close to closing, uh, include CDs for pharmacological studies, uh, such as pharmacokinetics, sample collection, tolerability, drug administrator, administration, phenotyping, seizures and epilepsy, omics, pediatric acquired epilepsy, genetic models of epilepsies, genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, neuropathology studies, neuroimaging, uh, and the very last report that is uh, in progress currently is uh, on rigor and reproducibility and transparency. So these cover different facets of the uh, work that we do in uh, epilepsy research. The next slide. And the, uh, the first set of the digital CRFs that we used, uh, taking as an example, the core C CDs, the uh, EEG and the physical uh, and the physiological CDs, uh, we joined forces with the Loney group, Karen Crawford, um, and through a lot of interactive sessions, uh, participation of junior investigators that were working with, with us that are acknowledged in the uh, acknowledgements of the report, uh, we generated uh, documents that include an XML form that can easily be downloaded by interested investigators and can be incorporated in REDCap databases and can be used at anyone's uh, REDCap database. Uh, so we finalized these digital CRFs and deposited them on the ILE website. You can see the link here if you want to visit or download the documents. And we hope that these are going to be useful for the community. Next slide. We received a lot of criticisms in the process. Obviously, researchers don't like to be placed in a box. They, they have free spirit. Uh, and also, that we do not have a, enough time to do absolutely anything that we want to do. So the persistent criticism was that this is cumbersome to include all this information. There's too many data elements. Uh, this, these are impractical. This is the main reason why uh, in the reports and the CRFs and CDs that we created, we attach a level of priority uh, that we felt uh, characterizes how important a CD element is. Another thing to remember is that certain CRFs can be filled once and can be repeated across experiments in a study. For example, if you keep doing EEG uh, uh, implantation and uh, acquisition in a batch of animals, you do not have to retype everything at the same time, but there is a possibility of generating cheat sheets and uh, populating the various cells for different cohorts, as long as uh, nothing uh, uh, changed. Um, and creating digital CRFs may facilitate the use of CDs, so we offered the first set uh, and collaborations with data analysts can also be useful in making the process more uh, quick for individual labs. And the next slide. And this is the last uh, concluding slides. Uh, 
that I would like to present, how do we use them in practice? It is very important to plan ahead. It is very important to have a, a concrete design and know what elements uh, are important for the, the type of research uh, that uh, each one of us is set to, to begin. Uh, and every uh, database or the workflow of the utilization of the databases, uh, it is much better if it is settled in the beginning rather than going back and changing uh, the way that these are collected. Uh, identifying a person to convert the CRFs to CDs for data analysis is important. Uh, some training is required so that you can avoid mistakes in uh, putting the data in the database. Identifying a person or a group and database format to create the digital CRFs uh, it is also very useful to be involved early in the process. And also it is important to consider the compatibility of the database with other similar databases that could be useful if data sharing is planned. And this is the whole principle of interoperability. Uh, you create a database, if it does not talk to a different database on, uh, on the same research arena, then you have to redo uh, a third database that could combine the various data. So uh, anticipating the interoperability is very important. And consider existing CDs and CRFs, if applicable to your research, before creating new, the whole purpose of the uh, data elements is to be common for many investigators to use the same language and not to have different uh, languages within the epilepsy research that we create a towel of Baba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an amazing talk. And uh, I think it was really interesting to hear about all, all the things you had to know about the common data elements. And also the points with, if you want to make uh, good basic science studies and translate the findings into humans, this is obviously a very important thing that needs to be in place. So thank you very much, Aristea. And then we will uh, move on to, to Christos. Uh, so Christos, the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, the organizers and everyone that uh, have put this initi initiative forward. And uh, my goal today is to advocate for uh, use of co common data elements and actually convince you that it's, uh, uh, it, it's going to save you time and uh, it's going to be uh, very easy to, to use them. So I'm going to go through uh, this. Uh, uh, based on some examples, I'm going to start with some considerations. And also, I'm going to discuss how we, we could use the information obtained from common data elements uh, to power our analysis. And, um, and uh, with that, I would like to go to the next slide, where is the outline of my talk. So I'm going to uh, first, uh, describe some considerations, talk about some considerations for using uh, a CD pipeline. Uh, then I'm going to discuss how we can collect CDs during an actual experiment. Uh, I'm going to follow by talking on um, how we can store uh, the CDs after an experiment. And the last, I'm going to discuss how we could um, use the collected uh, uh, common data elements for our analysis. So in the next slide, um, uh, these are some uh, uh, general considerations when we consider uh, using uh, CDs in, in our research. Um, some, some of the uh, obvious considerations are, uh, what are the outcomes of our studies? Are we looking at seizures? Are we looking at effects of uh, drug seizures? Are we looking at uh, uh, side effects of the treatment? How we can address those uh, things through uh, a, a specific experimental paradigm? Um, and uh, another important thing uh, to consider when uh, thinking about uh, using CDs uh, in research is what experimental procedures an experiment involves. Uh, does it involve uh, surgery for implanting electrodes for injecting uh, viral vectors? Does it include EEG recording? Uh, does it include uh, uh, anatomical assessments? Uh, does it include memory tests? Uh, so these are initial uh, initial things to consider because if we have in mind what we would like to to uh, to uh, to address, that is going to help us create uh, uh, specific case report forms to capture all uh, the CDs that are important for uh, our science. So. 
uh, in the next slide, um, if you heard about this uh, from both Vic and Aristea, uh, so to collect uh, CDs, it's important to have uh, um, like a structured form called uh, the, the CRF. This can be uh, either a paper form or it can be in a, an electronic form. And imagine this is something like uh, a lab book. So every everybody writes a lab book, and uh, it may be much easier actually to have uh, a, a case report form as your lab book because you already have all the information uh, typed in, uh, printed out. So you just need to fill uh, all the information, and you don't uh, really need to write all all the all the text that uh, that. Um, you would have to write uh, uh, for, for, uh, in your lab book. And uh, that is important because from one experiment to the next, uh, you are gonna have the same information with the same order. And that is really important when you would like to transfer this information to a database. So you you it makes your life easier, I think. Uh, and um, you can, I, as I said, you can either use a paper uh, form, you can print, uh, uh, like a small booklet and every time that you do surgery, you have your surgery CRF book. Or every time that you do anatomical assessments, you have your anatomical assessment uh, 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 book. So uh, that, that is how uh, we use it. Um, but of course we can discuss uh, any, any questions that, uh, that you have. So in the next slide, I'm going to give you some examples. So uh, here's a case report form when you use animals. Obviously, in our lab book, we write what species we use, what is the strain, where we got the animals from, whether the mouse or the rat was male or female, the housing and all of this information can be uh, structured this way. Uh, obviously, some of the information are repetitive. From one experiment to the next, uh, you pro possibly don't want to change the vendor. So uh, some some of the information, as Aristan mentioned, uh, can be uh, populated automatically, or you can uh, have that information printed in your lab book, so you don't need to put all the information again and again. So there is some flexibility based on uh, the experimental design. And I think... Uh, all, all this information and uh, what which things can be changed can be predicted at the onset of uh, of the experiment. So you don't have to auto populate all all the same information down the road. Um, in the next slide, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, another example. So uh, this is uh, an experiment that involves um, uh, uh, an injection of a convulsant into the brain of mice with a goal. Uh, to test whether the mice become epileptic. So when you inject uh, a chemoconvulsant, you would need to know the date of the surgery, what was the concentration of uh, the convulsant, what was the volume, uh, the injection site, whether you injected a, a, a chemoconvulsant or saline. So all of this information are structured in, in a way that uh, makes sense in, in terms of having the order of uh, uh, your different uh, variables. And... Um, and then you can you can create a, a form that I'm gonna show you the next slide. Um, uh, you can go back. Uh, I need a little bit more on this. Uh, and um, all the information that you could see in column one, you can easily transfer them into an Excel file. And this way you can uh, quickly uh, move your data from a paper format to an electronic format. Uh, another possibility is to use an Excel sheet during your experiment and type in on the information. Um, that, is, that is up to you and uh, what works uh, best. So in the next uh, slide, um, uh, you would see that uh, um, uh, this procedure specific CD, uh, CDs um, are focused on EEG surgery. So you would like to know whether your animals that you injected with kinic acid become epileptic. So you would need to implant electrode and uh, uh, monitor their brain electrical activity. So essentially there are several information that you always keep in your lab book and you can have them structured in a way uh, that is uh, consistent across your experiment. So you go back and you check what happened with animal uh, number one, number three, number four. So you have all the information uh, consistently represented in uh, your case report form. So you can easily compare uh, your data set across different animals. And ob obviously here you include information about where you implanted the electrodes. So as you can see in the schematic, we have 
electrodes in both sides of uh, of the brain, uh, electrodes that are in the hippocampus. So you would want to include uh, the coordinates of your electrodes so that other people can implant the same way, and you can also implant uh, and other people in your lab. Um, you want to, to include the type of electrodes that you use, whether they were screw electrodes, depth electrodes, all this information uh, are really important and uh, they're also included in uh, in your paper. So uh, it's, uh, it's straightforward to include uh, this information. And some of them, as I said, uh, won't change. So some information are gonna be already populated. So uh, in the next slide, um, you heard that already from uh, from Aristea that there are uh, several uh, companion papers where you can go through and see what exactly is important to uh, uh, to include in uh, in your CD in the, your list of CDs. There are some high priority CDs, some lower priority, so you can uh, decide which one uh, are applicable to your research and then. Uh, include them in uh, in your CDs and also uh, in uh, in uh, your papers. So here you can uh, include information about uh, the sampling rate of your recording, uh, what filters you used, uh, what is the sampling uh, frequency of your camera and your system. All this information uh, are really important for others to uh, uh, to to replicate uh, your findings. So in the next uh, slide, um, this is what you come up with. Uh, so when uh, when you have all the information from an experiment, and here I have an example of actually an analysis. So we know the animals have seizures, but we want to ask when they have seizures, how long the seizures last, uh, whether the seizures occur during lights off, lights on, what is the onset of the seizure, uh, is the seizure focal? So here you can expand the use of CDs beyond just reporting your uh, uh, um, uh, your procedures during the experiment. You can use CDs to also have a standardized way to report your findings. So there are several information that may be important in the end. May, they may not lead to something that is uh, very significant, but you would have a sense of uh, when the seizure happened, when you'd want to test uh, a, a, a protocol for stopping seizures, for instance. You would like to know what type of seizures the animals have. So all this information at the end of the analysis may uh, lead to novel findings. So, uh, and it's important to, uh, to, to plan ahead and uh, set some high priority CDs also for your analysis, because you never know what is gonna be important in the end. And uh, I think this this information is going to help you down the road. If you would like to do an additional analysis, you thought of something uh, interesting to test. So if you have all your data organized in a way that you can go back and just uh, uh, do a filtering, for instance, uh, and next uh, next slide, you just uh, you just filter your data, and um, and you can mine your data in different ways. And I think that is uh, that is really powerful because it can save you time. You don't need to do the experiment all over again. You can use the same data set for uh, different purposes. Purposes. So in the next slide, um, I'm showing you just an example. For instance, here we describe uh, how how seizures evolved in uh, in a mouse that was injected with hyaluronic acid. So uh, all this information would be very hard to do if you do, don't, do not have all the information from the beginning. For instance, you would want uh, for panel C to know when the seizures are happening, which recording day the animal had uh, uh, those seizures. Uh, you would want to have the when the seizure starts, when the seizure ends, so you, you measure the duration. Uh, you would want to have uh, whether the seizures occur during lights on and lights off, uh, time of the day, a.m., p.m., or when the mouse were uh, awake or asleep. So all of this information, when you do the analysis, you include them for uh, for for the seizures that you, you found. And um, all this information are in an Excel sheet, and uh, you can go back and do post hoc analysis. You would want to test new hypotheses. So you have your data in place, thanks to all the information that you have collected by planning ahead with all the CDs that uh, you would like to, to include. 
and uh, in the end it may lead to more uh, more papers and, and new findings. So in the next uh, uh, slide, that these are some concluding remarks. I truly believe that CDs are very beneficial for preclinical research. Uh, they, in the end, uh, 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 they can save you time, resources, and can lead to new discoveries uh, using an already uh, collected data set. And I think that is uh, truly powerful also for uh, the young generation. Um, uh, CDs help in sharing data with others in standardized format, and I think it's really important to stress here that uh, um, it, uh, it would be very helpful if you have your CDs as a supplement in, in your papers, because some of the journals, they don't allow a lot of uh, space to, to all, include all the information in, in the methods. So one way is to, to include uh, a supplement with uh, uh, with your Excel sheets or uh, uh, forms, as uh, ha this has been done in uh, in uh, the several papers of the ILA uh, translation NAS translation task force, and um, that was mentioned already that uh, you need to plan ahead, and there are several resources. Uh, available to support you in your planning. And you can reach out to people that have used them. You can read all the papers. And I think uh, uh, the community is very supportive in uh, in uh, using uh, and helping others. So uh, in, the last, in my last slide, I would like uh, to thank um, uh, all uh, the organizations that made this uh, initiative possible, ILA, AS, uh, cure epilepsy, and also uh, uh, the people behind all this uh, hard work. And um, I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to work in two labs that uh, uh, use CDs heavily. So I'd like to thank uh, Aristea and Helen for introducing me to this uh, great initiative. And also all the others that lead task forces, they wrote all the papers that has been very uh, inspiring for all of us. So uh, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Christos. This was a really good talk, and it was amazing to see how, how you could use uh, the common data elements in practice in so many different ways, all from planning the study to, to, to conducting and, and getting all the data to, yeah, to, to put it as, a, as an attachment when you're actually publishing the paper. And as you said, you might even discover things that you didn't think about. So it was really, really amazing. So thank you so much. So then we will move on to, to the last uh, speaker for, for today. Um, so Laura, please. <laughs> thank you so much, Cecily. And thank you so much to the other speakers who have shared the history of CDEs and CRFs and the importance in epilepsy research and how to use them. I think it's so important for us to be sharing this information uh, so that over time, more people are adopting these practices. Um, we... Um, recognize the need and a potential gap in the CDE um, library uh, when the, in 2001, the um, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy Summit uh, that brought together key stakeholders in the epilepsy community uh, came together to discuss important gaps and opportunities to advance issues related to this really important um, field of study on sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. The uh, summit included a set of basic science researchers, and they identified the need to better support early stage SUDEP research by creating tools to allow researchers to better characterize animal models. Currently in the field of SUDEP research, there is a big question about what constitutes an animal model of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And also they identified a gap in the ability to translate animal preclinical data to the clinical setting. Uh, there were questions about what are the endpoints from a suit up animal model that are meaningful in the clinical setting. So these were really important recognitions in the field of suit up research. And in the next slide. So what they, uh, they came up with a list of recommendations and um, some of the things that they identified were the need to have commonly understood definitions and terminology across epilepsy research fields, including SUDEP, and common data collection and reporting language to bridge preclinical research and clinical SUDEP. And clearly through the discussions that we've been having today, you can see how having common data elements would support these goals. Next slide. 
So Cure Epilepsy identified this gap and having had the benefit of having Lauren Hart Hargrove, who has been mentioned a number of times in this talk, uh, having Lauren on staff, we were able to um, start to help the community by creating clinically relevant sudden SUDEP research standardization tools, these CDEs. Um, we uh, we uh, put together a project plan to develop the CDEs, um, create data dictionaries, which have also been talked about already today, the associated case report forms that consolidate the CDEs, and those companion papers that describe the, the use of the CDEs with the goal of using these tools to improve the study transparency, rigor, and reproducibility, to reduce unnecessary redundancy, and importantly, to speed that preclinical to clinical translation of research, which is so critical for all areas of, of epilepsy research and particularly SUDA. Next slide. So you have already seen multiple examples of these case report forms, the data dictionaries or CDE databases, and we've talked about companion papers. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend time reiterating this. Uh, just know that um, this is the same sort of format that we've been using to approach our SUDEP data standardization project. Next slide. We use the same um, philosophy and approach that has been used for the development of epilepsy CDEs, following the model used by the ILAE and AES Joint Translational Task Force for our project. We developed a steering committee and they initially reviewed um, the existing CDEs in the community um, to make sure that we weren't um, reinventing the real wheel or being redundant in our practices. We really wanted to identify new modules that were specifically focused on SUDEP research. We then identified experts in the community who worked in SUDEP research uh, and developed nine different working groups to dig into the different um, module needs uh, for SUDEP. They were, uh, these working groups were convened and, um, and met multiple times to discuss what are the critical gaps in CDEs uh, related to epilepsy, but not yet relevant to SUDEP, and what, how do we go about um, correcting that. Um, these working groups identified key CDEs based on their own work and the work of others, um, and we have the intention of developing those companion papers. It's been mentioned that as a, an important part of this process is to provide the CDEs um, to the community for, for comment. And that's what we're currently doing at Cure Epilepsy. The CDEs and CRFs are available uh, right now on our website for this period of public feedback. Uh, and we really wanna hear from our community. Um, and that includes anybody who's listening to this, this webinar, um, either live or in the future, uh, as because your input is really important in developing the right tools for our community. We um, are doing sort of a rolling approach to feedback. We've had them available on our website. We are doing these open forum sessions as Aristea had referred to in the earlier uh, development of the earlier CDEs. Um, of course, we're having this current feed, this current opportunity to educate about CDEs. And we do hope that anybody who is currently on the webinar would be willing to stay afterwards and give us your feedback. We also intend to have feedback sessions at the Partners Against Mortality and Epilepsy or PAMI meeting as well at the end of this year, as well as the 2024 American Epilepsy Society meeting that will be hosted in um, Los Angeles, California um, later this year. The intention is again to develop those companion papers so that people know how to use these common data elements um, and also to submit these common data elements related to SUDEP to the NIH uh, National Library of Medicine CDE site. Um, so next slide. To date, uh, we have identified over 100 SUDEP specific CDEs um, and efforts are ongoing uh, clearly to refine them. 
we have developed a number of different case report forms or CRFs for these CDEs, and they are listed on this slide, an example of what's called the death-related uh, CDEs, which are very important in SUDEP research. And this example is shown in the middle of the slide. And again, we welcome your input on these CDEs and CRFs, and you can use the handy QR code shown in this slide, or you can go to the website, uh, cureepilepsy.org, at Research Resources to provide your input via a uh, survey form that we have there. Uh, in the last minutes that we have, I do want to acknowledge the many people who have been involved in this project thus far. Um, our steering committee um, is shown on this slide as on the next slide as well as the working group members who contributed to this effort. And of course, I want to acknowledge Lauren Hart Hargrove, who has moved on to another great opportunity. Um, but I want to thank her for her uh, extensive work on this project and the expertise that she brought to Cure Epilepsy in, um, in developing this project. Next slide. So I think uh, in our last five minutes, we can address any questions that might uh, you might have. Um, again, please um, feel free to stay with us after the webinar to ask any questions and provide feedback. Again, you can use this QR code to go to the website immediately if you're interested in doing that, taking a look at the CRFs. And of course, you can always contact us at Cure Epilepsy um, if you have questions or would like more information. And we can hold it there and address any questions. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really interesting to hear about the story behind all of this and, and also on the focus on, on SUDEP from Pure Epilepsy. So amazing work. Um, yes, uh, so I think, uh, I hope you have managed to scan the QR code and I think to, to see the questions, we need to go back. So I will stop screen sharing and then we can have a look in the Q&A if there's any questions. So, so if you have any questions, please, Please write them and we will we will answer them. And other speakers can probably come on if they would like to share there. If I can make a comment waiting for the questions. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate what Laura said. The feedback is very important. The, the main difference between creating a labs database and creating CDs is that CDs is a community product. It doesn't stop when a group makes a list of CDs, but it, it needs the community feedback to make it uh, something that the community is going to accept. It is not meant to be an imposed burden or prescription, but it's something that the community has to, to voice and it's very important for the audience to speak up now uh, and help those CDs get a better shape and form. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I actually have a question when we're waiting for other questions. Um, oh, hang on here, there is a question here. Uh, it's from uh, uh, Nato Kudura. Um, so I can read a question and it could also be seen in the Q&A section if you want to read it yourself. So he writes, I understand the importance of developing CDs and CDRs for preclinical SUDEP studies. However, what is the incentive for the researchers to input their information to the red cap to report to the CDs or CRFs? And he also writes, I guess this is important for the public, but relatively time consuming process for the preclinical researchers uh, doing the SUDEP research. Um, so uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, the importance is around data sharing and transparency. So when, um, and, and whatever format, and we're interested in hearing what format would be um, the, the most valuable to preclinical researchers. Um, it may be some of the examples that Christo shared, whether um, whether that's an Excel spreadsheet or a Word form or REDCap. We're certainly open to REDCap, although we recognize that, that uh, preclinical researchers may be less familiar with it. So we really want to hear what format would be helpful. Um, because again, the intention is not to increase the workload, but to you know, provide information in a way that, um, that others can easily access it. So the incentive is to share your data in a transparent way. 
so that others who are trying to replicate your studies um, or extend your studies will understand what it is you did uh, within that study uh, so that they can utilize similar approaches. Um, I would, Christos, would, what kind of answer would you give? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, with you, Laura. I think uh, sharing your data set, comparing with data set from other labs, I think that is uh, really powerful for uh, reproducing your findings and also uh, starting some collaborations with uh, young investigators that maybe don't have the funding yet to, uh, to do an animal study in a specific animal model that you don't have. I think that is something that uh, CDEs can help. And uh, one of the formats that uh, works really well can be a simple Excel format. You can uh, upload it to a shareable server. Uh, some of the journals require that so that the reviewers can see, you know, the data set. So uh, I don't think we need like a very fancy, uh, um, you know, software or something. Uh, it can even be a Google uh uh, a Google Documents. So um, making things easy, I think it's uh, it's really important for people to uh, to to start uh, using uh, using CDs, and um, it can lead to to more discoveries, collaborations, and great science. And if I can make a comment, the the collaborations in the preclinical arena just are just starting. I mean, but this is something that has been going on in the clinics. And if you think about the difference in the mentality between somebody who does a, a clinical study and somebody who does a preclinical study, the clinicians, the clinical researchers routinely put a data analyst in, uh, in the budget, in the work uh, group. So there's always a designated person to carry that burden. It's not up to the specific PI to do that necessarily. The preclinical researchers are just starting to pick up this, and I think perhaps it may be important to uh, put this item as a budget and in the uh, investigator uh, members that will be part of a clinical trial early on to facilitate this. Thank you so much for, for insightful and good answers. Uh, so there's also a part two of, of the question uh, which says, how about you allow for only the researchers who reported CDEs or CRFs to access the whole of uh, CDE or CRFs or include these in once into the author guidelines as a mandatory document to submit to epilepsy or epilepsy open? What do you think about that? I think there's always a way. I mean, this is not a no-no by Ia Cook. I mean, obviously, pseudop is not something that we impose on the animals. Pseudop can happen because of a disease, which is basically that's what the uh, research groups are trying to decipher and try to find solutions. So mm. it's a matter of justification of the research. I mean, you can do it, but you have to phrase it in a manner that is ethical and meaningful. Uh, do you guys think that um, using common data elements and attach them uh, to papers should be mandatory? Is that Would that be a way to make more researchers use common data elements in, in their research? I don't know who would like to answer this, but I think it's a really interesting question. <laughs> there is a lot of hesitance every time that I hear the mandatory word, I mean, there is a kind of jerk reaction because we had issues with that. I don't think, I, I don't think we are in a, in a position to impose something. I think it's, it, it's very important for people to understand the importance of doing this. You, I mean, we're all adults. I mean, it, it, it's not good to treat somebody as if they don't know what they're doing. But we have to hear also the investigators and we have to make it easier for them to follow. And I think that's where the, the future is going to hold. I mean, it's not a dictatorship. It's just a way of working together to make something better. And perhaps, Vicky, um, maybe you can um, discuss a little bit about the data sharing uh, future that NIH perceives, because that may be very useful for the whole idea of sharing the research. Um, so the data sharing policy now at NIH is that investigators are required to share 
their data and to deposit that data in a publicly accessible bio data repository. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion now at NIH about making use of common data elements required in NIH funded research. We also haven't taken that step yet other than an NINDS, it is highly encouraged and, and to use the common data elements in clinical trials and clinical studies. And very often when we issue the milestones in a grant award, we will re then at that step require them to use common data elements. So the interesting thing right now at NIH is that you can, and I, as I'll echo what Aristea said, absolutely should budget for data management and um, data processing and analyses in your grant. Um, and But the interesting thing is, is that reviewers see that budget, but they don't see your data sharing plan. We program staff review your data sharing plan after review. So it's a, it's, it's a little challenging right now for reviewers because that when they do see money in the budget for funding in the budget for data management and sharing, they don't always know exactly what's being proposed. So we're kind of working through that. But again, um, I think you it, 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 preclinical researchers will need to start doing that in their grant applications. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was some very nice and interesting discussion about this. Uh, if so, I make a, a further yeah. comment on this, yeah. Please. So I think so, some journals require uh, not, com they don't call it common data elements, but they have an extensive method section where you need to report, uh, they call it start protocol so that you have all your specific information, which antibody you used, which mouse model with all the identifiers. Uh, and then you can be even more specific in, in these instances. So they it's considered mandatory for, for these journals. Uh, but I agree that um, it should be also up to uh, to the researcher what they feel comfortable doing and uh, what information they uh, should include. But it's always nice to have a sense of uh, which list of CDs they used, uh, which uh, uh, equipment or uh, consumable so that uh, other people can go ahead and do the same experiment and uh, see whether they get the same results. So I think it's, uh, that's my thinking. Thank you. That's a very good point. Um, so there is also uh, some other questions. Uh, so the first one uh, is uh, because death cannot be used as an endpoint in animal studies, uh, there's a lot of pushback from the IACUC uh, to establish animal protocol to study pseudep in animals. Is it possible to include some wording in SUDEP CDE to address this issue so that we can cite? I can address that. I think that that is an excellent point. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing up that concern. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at the CDEs and, um, and we'd be happy to work with you um, if you want to reach out to me, Laura Lovers at Cure Epilepsy, to think about ways to do that, uh, because I think that this could be a really helpful resource um, for researchers uh, and for IACUX, as well as journals. For sure. So um, excellent point. Let's work together on that to make sure that these CDEs fit that purpose. A really good point. Mm, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to also comment on this or if not, we could also move on to, to the next question. And uh, so this is the next question is from Daniel uh, Therese. Um, and he asks, uh, beside the use of international guidelines for reporting, is there any interest uh, from the editorial office of scientific journals uh, to reinforce the use of CDEs or CRFs, uh, not only as a requirement, for, but facilitating the reporting? Uh, for example, length, uh, restrictions, uh, pre-registration, and so on. Yeah, I can take that. It's, it's an excellent point, uh, but also a two-edged sword. Because if you put too much burden on the person who submits a manuscript, uh, it's going to be more difficult, more cumbersome for them to submit. So, I mean, the, in, in publishing, you care about pub in, increasing the chance of publishing 
good quality research and not putting so many firewalls. Um, so in order to make it, to create a balance between uh, putting all the data or all the uh, CDs up front and too many details uh, and not giving the details, uh, in the editorial uh, boards, we decided to recommend it, but not make it mandatory. Obviously, it's highly recommended to publish everything, as has been uh, spoken before, uh, a supplement or part of the paper. But the more you ask from the authors, they're not going to send the, the papers there. Uh, and more, may, much of the research is going to uh, stay unpublished. So it's really uh, important to, to frame it in a way that um, you encourage the publication of meaningful data, but don't put too many you know, firewalls to the people to do that. Uh, and the other concern is, especially now with artificial intelligence, the more mechanical is the submission with tables and specific formats, I worry about what we're going to get for review, whether something is going to be truly reflective of what the investigator did or just a standardized table that has been successful in getting published before and is just copied, paid and modified. I mean, we've had examples like that. Uh, so. There is always a value of having the authors actually write and read and submit rather than just um, mechanically create tables and, and formats. So we have to be careful. That's all I say. Important points, but I think, you know, where possible, that's one of the issues we're trying to solve. One of the gaps is that, I mean, because of page restrictions, um, there have been there is more limited information on the methods used. And I think that that's, you know, not the, um, you know, that's something that researchers have had to accommodate over time. So any way that we can encourage um, good quality reporting on this, that is enabling again of, of um, studies, understanding the studies and then future studies, uh, I think is a is a beneficial thing. And from a funder perspective, and cure epilepsy is very precious philanthropically derived funding. You know, we want to make sure that data that are that are generated and published are is interpretable as possible. We want to maximize our investments by ensuring that there's quality research being done and that it's available to the community to understand. And that's part of our motivation for doing this. Um, we we hate to see you know, research not being, you know, followed up on because people don't understand what exactly happened in that study. So, uh, and we are seeing some researchers, especially for areas like SUDEP research and post-traumatic epilepsy research, where um, these studies are really challenging to do in the preclinical space. And, um, and at times we need to bring together data sets in, in order to really maximize the utilization of those of those data. Um, that again is a motivation for us to be invested in this space, again, to enable as much research to be, to come out of what we fund as possible. Thank you so much. That was a very good discussion, I think, about the different points and, and all of this about common data elements and how to use them. And of course, should it be mandatory or how, how can we make people use them without pushing it too much. Great. Um, so I don't think there is any more questions, uh, at least not for now. Um, and, and I think also we're at about a little bit over time. So so I guess maybe that, that means we should, um, uh, should uh, think about ending the webinar. Uh, so I will thank all the organizers and, and the speakers for some excellent talks and, and, and also the participants for, for joining and, and for, for being part of, of the discussion afterwards. Um, and I'm hoping that you would be able to, to try out the accommodate elements for, for SUDEP research from the Cure Epilepsy and, and also to give feedback on them if you've been participating or if you will participate in the future uh, so that they can be improved and be as good as possible. Um, Yes, so so thank you everyone. I guess then it's time to to close this webinar. Um, and we do hope that people will stay on um, and and provide additional feedback. Mm -hmm. um, we can turn the recording off, um, but then again, we would welcome um, mm -hmm. participants to to stay on and uh, and give us additional feedback. We have some prompting questions that we'd love to hear. You know, your your get your input on. Thank you.
Et là, on stop the recording.